Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast today. And today we have a very uh, special guest on the show. His name is John Ilsley, and I think I'm saying that right based on what how he told me to say it. You might know him from a little band called Dire Straits. So welcome, John. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. It's a bit nippy here in England, I have to say. I've just got back from Mexico, so the uh, dip drop in temperature was quite serious. I must say, we had a frost this morning on the ground. And anyway, there we are. I'm, I'm very well. Thank you. What's going on with you right now is, as far as your, your music and so forth? And we'll kind of then we'll dive deep and kind of, you know, what led you down this this path and this journey? I'm still completely uh, not obsessed, but fascinated about um, trying to write a good song. I still have a, a desire to communicate with the outside world through music and verse. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to find something interesting for me initially, then hopefully for somebody else after that. So uh, it's a drive, but it's just it's just a gentle drive. You know, I mean, I got up early this morning because I was jet lagged and, you know, sat in the kitchen with a cup of tea and a guitar and... Um, you know, hit out a few little ideas, which on on the iPhone. And uh, so the jigsaw puzzle starts, you know, and um, it's quite interesting how things come together, I find, these days. Now, do you feel like after having such a, a great career, do you somewhat forget about that, you know, and just every day's a new day when you have that passion? I've put it into a, into I hope put it into some kind of perspective because it was, it was quite an extreme experience, I must say. Funnily enough, when you're actually going through it, it seems, I know it sounds crazy, it seems kind of normal. You know, when you, the way the band was operating and uh, we were very fortunate and the band was successful and that opens up a lot of possibilities with music and with uh, how you change your music, develop your music. And so um, you have to put it in perspective because we stopped, we stopped touring and making music in 1992, which is actually 30 years ago. But I'm constantly reminded of it because, well, modern day communications, the the you know the internet and such like and i get i get really generally speaking a lot of very positive things th- from people all over the world, which I think is what the wonderful thing about the internet is that we can communicate. These are the good things about the internet. There's lots of things that aren't so good, but the good things about it are the fact that it's a wonderful communication tool. Uh, So I get to talk to people and communicate with people who have just discovered Dire Straits, like a 17-year-old kid in in Shanghai or something, you know, or uh, in India. Somebody wrote to me in India the other day. I think he was a 19-year-old kid who just started playing the guitar and discovered Salt to Swing and things like that which is it is kind of a gentle reminder about um you know having left a bit of a legacy behind which is always it's a good feeling it's not a bad feeling it's a very good feeling and i'm very i felt very honored to be part of that um story if you like the dire straight story um working with mark was a, a privilege and a, and a and a pleasure when you listen to some of your music outside of uh outside of some of the the songs that you're not you know that people know did you ever think this was like a somewhat of a spiritual journey in a way because your sound was very very worldly you know in a way a very you know i don't know how to describe it but it's a somewhat of a different tone than what you would normally hear i mean i think that we would a little bit surprised about how it became a global uh, phenomena, actually. If everybody could figure that out, then, you know, we'd all be, everybody would be selling lots of records and having lots of success. But it's a bit of a mystery, I think. And as long as it remains a mystery, I think that's rather interesting. But I mean, the English language is is a is a great way uh part a great part of the music scene that actually uh, a lot of people learn the english language through song but i think that some people have the ability and i'm saying this about mark really some people have the ability to write a song which communicates on several different levels which it's an easy thing to say but a difficult thing to do and if you asked him the same question he'd probably say i have no idea if you broke that down and put that in a perspective of vibrations you know because i think i think there's certain talents you know out in the world that are able to express themselves with different types of vibrations and certain vibrations can hit you know resonate or you know certain vibrations will resonate with multiple of people you know it's all about 
you know, relatability. Did you ever think about projecting those type of vibrations? Well, that's probably quite a good way of describing it. But I don't know whether we're we're no more worldly than a lot of other people. I just think that some things just capture people's imagination. I think the ability to communicate through song is a great talent, if you like, which is why, I, as I said to you earlier, I spend a lot of time, you know, trying to, you know, I've got eight solo albums now, so I've had plenty of practice at writing. And I enjoy the process, but you, you don't really know how it's going to be absorbed by people. And I think that's where, but your idea of resonance, I think, is quite a good, good way of describing it. Some things resonate, some things don't. I mean, we know the bands that resonate around the world, you know, your Fleetwood Macs, your Eagles, your Who's, your Rolling Stones, the Beatles, particularly, you know, ACDC on a different kind of level. I mean, there, there are some bands that just manage to communicate on a bigger scale. Uh, Coldplay's having a great time of it right now. You too had a wonderful, a wonderful moments. And we can pick them, you know, there's sort of a, a dozen, say, seriously major bands that have influenced music on a fairly big scale. They've, and your word resonance, I think, is a very good way of describing it. It resonates with other people, whether they're in India, Africa, or New Zealand. You know, it's not just about America and the UK, although, to be honest, that's where most of the mod, most of the music's always come from, America and, and, and the UK. It, I think as long as it remains a bit of a mystery, uh, you know, that's what sort of I so entices us into the possibility of keeping going. <laughs> I mean, I don't really need to do anything else, but I do, I do enjoy the process. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think it's a drive, right? It's an internal drive. And certain people, I think certain artists realize at a certain time in their life, this internal drive is going to be there regardless. And yeah, that yeah. makes sense. I, I think that some people just communicate uh, differently. I'm, I'm, I'm better at communicating with, I mean, I do paint a lot. I don't know whether you know this. It's my other, the other thing that I do is I paint, which is a very different form of communication. I, I paint abstract uh, uh, paintings, you know, with a bit of a, you know, whatever you have to decide for yourself whether you whether you what you think of them. But you know, it's it's a way I communicate without using words and without using music. So I I have both those things going for me. I was in the studio today trying to figure something out, and and um, you know, so that's it's. A, I have a daily sort of process with art and music. Sometimes it's all art, sometimes it's music, and sometimes it's neither. But I think they're just they're wonderful communication tools. And you know, when I hear um, politicians trying to communicate with us. They do it on such a narrow band, mm -hmm. you know. It, it it doesn't it doesn't move people. It's just sort of it, they're they're preaching in a sense in in some sort of way, and often not very effectively. Whereas music is an emotional thing, and I think it excites people. It does something to our endorphins and makes us feel good. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it. And 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 all sorts of different types of music make people feel differently. My daughter is a, you know, she's, she's 24 years old and she said, dad, you've got to listen to Taylor Swift. And I think she's just wonderful. You know, she's a fantastic communicator. I think there's only a few in this day and time, because if you think about some of your time, you know, of communicating, things were a lot simpler, you yeah. know, things were more clear and tone always works. I think when you realize tone always works and you can see, you know, the younger generations gravitating to, you know, clear, simple music, they're going back to your time. Well, in some ways, you know, when I first started listening to music, I went back as well. I, I was, I think, 14 when the Beatles were 15 or something, when the Beatles hit the, hit the, uh, you know, hit the headlines and the stones and stuff. But then I went back and just and found out where they'd where they'd found their ideas from, which was the old blues stuff and gospel and, and all the rest of it. So I think everybody, everybody, if they're interested in music, you know, you look back as well because it forms the, the shape of where you are now and everything that's happening now has come from somewhere else. Because I, I think technology has somewhat created too many choices. And I think you said something about politicians. You know, those politicians are, are, trying to play to the population, which is very, very diluted, if you will. Does that make sense? <laughs> diluted, that's a good word. Um, God, you know, there's a lot of choices out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, yeah. know, you don't really know where to find good music. And like, I think there's got to be a rebirth or a reset to make people understand that. 
you know, because they're, you know, kids don't know what to choose or what, where, what direction to go into. You have to have your own filters. I think you have to filter out the stuff that, you know, I listen to things that again, that's definitely not for me. I like words and I like music with words. I don't like purely electronic music. It's not something I would sit and listen to, but I know it's a, it's a big deal. But people, you get, you get a whole crowd of 30,000 people all jumping up and down with their arms in the air because the guy on the stage is jumping around with his arms in the air. There's no, no vocals. It's just literally literally a form of energy, a form of communicating energy. So that uh, you, you go back to what you said, there's so much stuff out there, a lot of stuff. I, I don't know how many tracks are loaded onto Spotify every day, but it's a colossal amount of music. You just physically, mentally don't have the time to filter all that out. So, I mean, it's easy for me because I'm a sucker for singer songwriters. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm very happy with Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Van Morrison, you know, the birds, you know, I mean, I, I just like good songs. That's just, for me, it's the dead simple. So that really pushes me away from an awful lot of stuff that I can't, I don't have the time. I just don't physically have the time to, to listen to it. So if, well, if, <laughs> if one of my kids says to me, I mean, my son is a DJ and he works with electronic music and so on. He plays something to me that, and it was actually fascinating. I, I ended up, <laughs> ended up listening to the bass line actually, because it was a great, it wasn't, it wasn't a bass guitar. It was a, it was a keyboard bass. But I loved, I loved what he was doing, this guy was doing with this bass. And I thought, well, I'm going to nick a few of those ideas. There's too much of everything, really. I mean, this is, this is the world we live in. And I feel, I, going back to the politicians, I feel quite sorry for them because actually trying to get through to people seems to be increasingly more difficult because people are so wary about what people are saying. And they just kind of don't believe any of it anymore, which is a shame because when I was growing up, I felt that politicians, they were more statesmanlike. You know, they were doing it for a different kind of reason than they are now. Or anything about people now, it's an identity driven world. And they, yes. to some extent, they are placating to yeah, that. Exactly. And, you know, and, and going back to choices, and f- I'm about focused energy. And a lot of people don't realize it. Like, you know, when y'all made an album and how focused you were, and, you know, the production on one song, I mean, what yeah. was the budget? I mean, now the production on one song, you can make a song for two grand. What was, you know what I'm saying? What was the focus and what was the budget on one song? You know, I think there's something to that. I think that's a good point. I, I mean, we, we, we did address the albums as each individual piece of work. So, you know, it's quite old fashioned now to think about putting a, putting a record on, you know, a vinyl on the record player. And so you thought very carefully about how you started the record, what finished the first side before you flipped it over. And, and, and the idea was that you made a piece of music that people would sit down and listen to the whole thing. They wouldn't just take one track off it or whatever. It's that's all changed now. So, but I mean, I'm still very traditional. I still make my albums like I want somebody to put it on at the beginning and run it through to the end. Mm-hmm. So I think very carefully, and and the Straits thought very carefully about how we, um, you know, constructed the the albums. And you're right, we spend a lot of time on some of the. I mean, for instance, Telegraph Road. Take that as an example. That was a a, a difficult thing to get together because it's you know actually playing live it was easy because it just has this but when you're trying to record it um it's a different kind of thing i mean 14 minutes is quite a you know quite a thing to keep that level of energy right and so yeah i mean if you analyzed every track what what you spent on every track i mean you'd be you'd probably think oh my god you wouldn't do that now but Mm -hmm. i still do it now because i just love the process of recording with proper musicians in the room difficult with covid of course it was but you know we got around it so i think there's a there's a traditional approach to it but there's lots of other approaches to it i mean but you can you, you can make an album on what i'm talking to you through now on a laptop i mean I don't know how to do it, but um, people do. I mean, they make it in their living rooms and it sounds, it seems to sound completely fine. Funny you say this, because this, this is what I recognize. I manage a, a country artist who is on The Voice. His name is Avery Robertson. And uh-huh. and a lot of these young kids, like when you came up with an initial idea for a song and you laid the song down, I know there's excitement with that initial idea. You know, how many times did you go back to that song to perfect it? Because I think a lot of times these kids will take an initial idea, get excited and want to get the music out there too quickly. Before they let it, that before they digest it, look at it again, go back in, digest more, look at it again to perfect it. Because the anxiety that is created uh, with social media and, and technology, they yeah. want to get it out there. They want to get it out there. Like 
How many times did you go back to a song to perfect it? Uh, quite a lot, actually, I would say. Although some songs were just uh, easier to get to where you wanted to get to. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, for instance, was just the most uh, beautiful kind of simplicity in a way. It was just a question of getting the right uh, feeling on that one. But the first time that Mark played it to me on his national, he came out of the house and, and he said, I, I, I've written this thing, I think it's okay. And I said, it's more than okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of, you've written it, you've written it already. I mean, all we're going to do is just add a few bass notes and a bit of drums on it and it's done. But then of course it's more than that, obviously. But I mean, uh, each song is approached with, um, with the intention of trying to get the best out of it. And sometimes the several different versions uh, and some of, some I've completely forgotten. I mean, the original version of Sultans that we, we had was like a, was like slightly country sort of thing, you know. I think the chords were similar, but it had that country feel to it. And uh, it's only when the red Stratocaster arrived that suddenly we got where we, where we are now with songs so each song has its own um sort of uh sense of discovery in a way uh, just to go back to telegraph road for instance i mean we 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 actually rehearsed the songs for love over gold while we were on tour doing the making movies uh tour in 1980 8081 um we so we used the sound checks for actually um working out all the different passages and so uh, and, and tunes and stuff because we, you know, sound checks are very boring. So we thought we'd, we'd actually, we'd work on the new album while we were touring on the last one. So when we got back home to go and record Love of the Gold in, in New York at the power station, it was easier. But having, having said that, private investigations was a tricky one. Mm -hmm. That was a tricky one to get that right. How did money for nothing? How did that come about? I mean, I know that's one you probably hate hearing about. You're like, but you know, I got to ask you, I got to ask you about money for nothing. You're probably like, damn, I don't want to talk about that song. I hear it all the time. How did that happen? Initially, uh, Mark had moved to New York with uh, his, 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 uh, his, his wife, Lords, and they'd bought a house in, um, in Manhattan, uh, in the village, I think. And, um, I think he, he, you have to imagine Mark going into a white goods store and looking at refrigerators and televisions and stuff like that, which, of course, is a very interesting thought. But he was in this store trying to buy some, uh, you know, bits of kit for the house, you know, because he needed TVs and washing machines and dishwashers and stuff like that. So he was in the store and he walked into a room where there was um, – this is the early days of uh, MTV. There was a, literally a wall of – TV screens all on all on MTV. So he was he was he started watching this and suddenly overheard some of the guys in the store talking about what was on the screen. And I'm not sure who the artist was on the screen, but they were saying they were saying things like that ain't working. That's the way you do it. That's just that's money for nothing. That I mean, these guys they get all the girls, you know, they get chicks for nothing and free, chicks for free and blah blah blah. And Mark was standing behind the refrigerator, sort of writing all these little ideas down for this song, and then suddenly a appeared and he said i've got this i've got this song called money for nothing but the lick the lick the lick the guitar lick obviously came later and um in fact the sound of the guitar was an accident as well because we were in montserrat uh, when we recorded we recorded the brothers in arms album in montserrat at the end of a session somebody knocked over one of the microphones in, in front of one of mark's amps and uh mark was just mucking about you know playing playing the riff and all the rest of it trying to get the sound and somebody knocked the microphone over by mistake and suddenly there was a yell from the control room they said that's it that's the sound and we said well the microphone's lying on the floor he said i don't care where it is that is the sound right that's the sound you're not we want on this track and we went into the control room and it was absolutely spot on so that's you know these accidents happen and um of course omar hakim who you probably know used to play with um with Sting in his band, the drummer, he came over and um, he did all the drum work on that, which was a great pleasure playing with him. But, you know, it's how things come about, sometimes by accident, just by... It's, what I'm talking about is really observation. I yeah. mean, Mark observing those guys talking about MTV, you know, we hadn't got MTV over in the UK by then. It came a bit later. But this was just listening to people talking about, you know, what was going yeah. on. And uh, the thing about songwriters is they pick up on things that other people don't pick up on. They hear things and they go, oh, that's a good idea for a song. What's your foundation, you know, with that, with your projection and somewhat of a, I guess the sound would be called Celtic. I mean, mom and dad, were they artists? Uh, was any 
people in the family, artists, you know, this, where did this come from? Well, my, I, I, I had no, uh, my parents were not musical and they weren't artists. They were, my father was a local bank manager in the middle of England in Leicestershire. Uh, he'd got back from the war and essentially, like a lot of people who just got back from the war, he wanted his family to be safe. So he was, he was intent on uh, creating a world around us, which was a safe world. And in fact, actually, uh, I, I wrote a song about it, actually, which is on the new album, uh, which is called Eight. And it's called Mark. Town, and it's really that will give you an idea about what life was like in those days. But it was a very safe world, you know. They'd come through, and of course, in the fifties, everybody was on um, rationing and all that kind of stuff. I don't know whether you had that in America; you probably didn't. But so I grew up in a very comfortable environment. But then I discovered music, yeah. and that completely turned me upside down. I heard Chuck Berry, I think, through a, a very small crystal radio set. You know, some wayward radio station was playing American. American music, Chuck Berry, and then I heard Elvis, and I thought, oh, my God, what's going on out there? It just completely flipped me out. And I thought, i gotta, I got to have some of this. I don't know what it was, and I said, I need it. I just said to my dad, I need a guitar. And he said, what do you mean you need a guitar? And I said, I don't know, I need a guitar. I've got, I, I want to play a guitar. And so I saved up my pocket money for weeks and weeks on end and bought the cheapest thing from the local shop, which was a horrible thing to play. But And, I, and that was it. That just got me going. So I think that what it was, I was in a very safe house, but there was no, there wasn't enough emotional contact with the world. And I needed something more than that safe world. And so ever since that moment, I've sort of taken the, the other path rather than the safe path, if you like, which is probably why I ended up being a musician. And I still do that now. I still take the unpredictable path because, you know, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. And I, and I like that. So I don't know whether I've given that to my children or not. I have no idea, but they'll probably surprise me at some point. Do you feel like you're a highly sensitive person? Oh, gosh, that's a very personal question to ask. I don't really, I mean. You know, because well, the reason I asked, true artist, you know, if you picked up the guitar, I would imagine it didn't take you long to catch on based on just just based on my read. And I think that comes from, you know, you know, great artists are highly sensitive people. So I don't think it's a, a, a bad thing or anything. I think it just tells the story a little more about who you truly are in a way, you know? Well, it goes back to that, you know, that excitement about hearing, uh, you know, rock and roll, Elvis and, and Chuck Berry and the Beatles and the Stones, hearing all that and just feeling something inside. So I suppose it turned something on in me, uh, some sensitivity to, to that kind of music. And so I was kind of, from that point on, I just remember being determined to be part of this world. And I didn't quite know in what capacity, because before the straight started, I'd played in... <sighs> seven, eight different bands, blues bands, folk bands, jazz bands even, for God's sake. You know, I just loved playing music, especially playing with other people. And I think that's the... That's the core. Doing things on your own is fine. I have to, you have to do things on your own because you have to practice and you have to work things out. But playing with other people is still the greatest pleasure. And I love playing live. I love doing gigs, even if they're small gigs. I don't care. I don't care whether it's big or small. It doesn't matter. I don't care. It can be anything. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I think it satisfies my sense of myself, if you like, how I think about, how I think about the world and how I feel in the world. The only reason I say that, just give you a little background about myself. I'm a, I'm a clairsentient <clears throat> and I'm somewhat of a reluctant shaman. I have very high sensitivities myself and I've, I've been going through this, like unearthing all this, you know, in the past five, 10 years. Uh -huh. So it's just, you know, a lot of these thoughts go through my head that are very intriguing that I didn't have in my, my twenties and thirties, you know? So, uh, you know, when, when you have these gifts show up in your life, you start to look at human beings a little different. Uh -huh. That's the only reason I asked that question. I think there's a, a big difference between a true artist and an, and an artist who's trying to be an artist. Yeah, I, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference, but you're probably, I mean, you're probably quite uh, intuitive then. I mean, obviously, you've got a natural intuition towards, you know, measuring people or uh, working people out. I mean, I've got a lot of artist friends, you know, especially painters, actually, funnily enough, and they are, they are diff they're a different kind of person than anybody else. Most people who paint don't, don't actually sell their paintings. <laughs> I've discovered there's an awful lot of paintings sitting around in people's places, which 
are never going to leave that place. But there's something about um, the sensitivity towards the world, I suppose, is what I'm thinking of, and how you deal with the world, because uh, especially now, there's more distractions. When I was growing up, there were very few distractions. So, you know, there wasn't much television to watch. There was no internet. There was no phones. There was no nothing. It was basically, oh, great, I found the guitar. This is this is going to be my modus operandi. I'm going to... And then I discovered the bass, which, of course, you know, is really my instrument. It's a, That's how I know how to play a song is through the bass, if you like. And I'm sure that that resonated to your success. When you recognize that, you're like, that's what I'm the best in the world at. Yeah, I just felt, I, I just, as soon as I picked it up, even though I didn't want to, because I wanted to join the band as a guitar player, the first band, and they said, mm-hmm. no, you can't, you've got to play the bass. And I said, I don't have a bass. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and my brother, my brother William, who uh, he was very good at making things, he made me one. He made me one. It looked like a spade. Somehow or other, he made me a bass, and that was my first guitar. And I suddenly thought, this is me. Uh-huh. This, is, this is where I fit in to this world. Gotcha. And I think that I was able, uh, when I, when Mark and I got together, to recognize where I needed to be in that place. You know, I, 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 I imme- he and I immediately sort of made sense together musically because we'd obviously been listening to the same because we're exactly the same age we've been listening to the same kinds of music all over these years and so you know as soon as he picked up the guitar and started playing i just joined in on the bass and it was like oh that's the way it should be you know Mm -hmm. it was just it was wonderfully obvious in a way Mm -hmm. and i think that's that was that as soon as that happened i knew that dire straits was going to be something different no idea it was going to do what it did but I knew it was going to be something worthy, if you like. We'll bring this to a close and we'll talk about the book. But I have one more question about like the foundation and in, in your environment. It's a Celtic, like worldly sound. Is that environmentally, does that come from, you know, from the area, from England? Where did that, those roots you think came from? Well, the Celtic roots. Yes. Like, um, well, like the sound, like what would you classify the worldly sound of some of those songs that may not have been the most famous ones. What would you classify? Is that a Celtic? Is that Where does that come from? Well, it, I think it just comes from so many different sources. I think we can go back to where we were talking about about half an hour ago, how that managed that thread managed to sort of communicate with a lot of different places in the world. This, the Celtic the Celtic thing is definitely part of it, but I think it's it's more to do with each song needing its own particular treatment, its own its own a world, if you like. Mm-hmm. And so each song was dealt with individually. I think because we were of a certain age, Mark and I, we were 26 when we met, and um, we'd both been listening to the same kind of folk music, country music, rock and roll music, jazz, black music, reggae. We'd been listening to all that kind of stuff. So that feeds into you, and you don't really forget any of it. It just comes out when necessary to make that particular song, whatever it is, come alive. Gotcha. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, I know you have a, a book out there and, and some other things. Tell us a little bit about that, and where do we find anything John Ilsley? Well, uh, um, there's quite a bit of John Ilsley stuff out there. It turns out I'm having, <laughs> having eight. To find you, right? <laughs> um, as I said, I've got eight solo albums, so there's there's quite a bit of music out there. This last album seems to number eight seems to have been the most successful, um, which has been very pleasing. And I'm getting feedback from all over the world on this one, so uh, which is which is good. And then what happens is you have a, a successful album, and then people go look back at your other ones. So everything seems to have picked up a lot over the last year actually with all the all the albums all the songs and then the book well um i was approached by a a lady at a a charity function i didn't realize who she was but i was sitting next to a a a literary agent and she'd been to see one of the shows i was doing which was called the life and times of dire straits which was me talking to uh one of my ex-managers and chatting about the whole history of the band and then playing songs in association with that particular period of time. So it was like a sort of a chat and, and music, you know, it was music and talk. And she came to see the show and she sat next to me at, a, at this charity supper. And she said, you, you should write a book. And I said, what do you mean write a book? She said, well, I'm a literary agent. I said, I think I can get you a, a book deal. And I said, oh my God, no, I, can, I, I can write songs, but I'm not sure about writing a book. I said, I need some help with that. But anyway, one thing led to another and, 
I agreed to go and talk to her, and and uh, she got me a, a contract with uh, Penguin, a uh, Trans World, which was pretty good. So a friend of mine who uh, I've known for many years, who was a professional ghostwriter, who knew nothing about music, this chap, I said, look, I've been offered this book deal, but I I I can write, but I can't write a book. I can I've got all the ideas in my head. I can remember amazingly quite a lot of the stuff we did. Uh, will you help me put it together? And so we did this thing together. And I was very pleased with the result because, as I said to you, he doesn't, he didn't know anything about music. So I had to literally teach him about what it was like to be in a band and how it works and how you make records and how you do gigs and all the rest of it. And so he had a certain naivety about it. And yeah, I mean, and I, it's certainly out in America. I think it's out um, on uh, Division Books or something. I don't know the company, but it's actually done quite well, which is quite pleasing. Like, you're always a bit frightened when you put out something that, is not what you normally do. And the name of that book is on this letter by now. If you, if the book John is talking about is, is my life in dire straits. Well, the thing is, you know, for me, John, it was really a celebration mm -hmm. more than anything else. It was a celebration of the story that I was involved in and all the people, especially Mark, you know, and all the people involved, Mark and the crew and the caterers and the lighting guys and the truck drivers and the other band members, wonderful musicians we had over the years. I mean, we played, got to play with some great people. We got to play in some fantastic places. It was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I wanted to, uh, that, and so that's why I wanted to put it down actually to make people really think about what it was like to be in that situation and uh, the joy not only it gave me, but hopefully gave an awful lot of other people. As I said, it's a celebration to me of, you know, having had a very, very good life and um, still being here to tell the tale. Has, in, has anybody approached you about a film? Is I just got, I can't imagine who how that would work. I mean, the, the Queen film was uh, remarkable in, in, in how it worked. I mean, it, it worked very well. It would have to be an awesome movie, I would think. Well, it would, it would be, but I mean, it's really, it's making records, doing gigs, making records, doing gigs, you know, divorces, marriages, children, you know, all sorts of stuff on the road, which we don't talk about. And, uh, you know, just a sort of a, you know, I, I, I don't know. Nobody's even asked the question yet. So, well. Well, John, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. It's very easy to talk to you. And hopefully um, people can listen to this and learn something about life and humanity and what it's like being an artist. But yes, I appreciate you coming on the show. And it was fun. This is oh, Mr. John Ilsley, and I am John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm -hmm.